Thanks everybody for joining us again for our weekly sheep and goat webinar series. Um, of course, you can find any information that we have available to you on our Facebook page at UI Sheep and Goat and our YouTube channel, University of Idaho Extension Livestock, and also on our webpage. I'm Melinda Ellison, uh, the Extension Sheep Specialist for the University of Idaho, and your other host is Carmen Wilmore, who is an Extension Educator in Lincoln County. And um, we'll go ahead and get started with our speaker today, who's Rebecca Kern. She's with Board Laboratories, and she's going to be visiting with us today about pasture sampling for small ruminants. So I'll Okay, thank you um, for the introduction, Melinda. Um, so I just kind of wanted to tell you guys a little bit about myself to just establish you know, what qualifies me to talk to you guys about pasture sampling. Um, so I got my start in animal science by feeding dairy cows in high school in Minnesota. From there, that is what led me to pursue a degree in animal sciences, a bachelor's at the University of Wyoming. Then I did my master's of animal nutrition at University of Wyoming, which is where I met your host, Melinda. Um, she was doing her PhD at the same time when I was doing my master's. And then I did an internship at the U.S. Meat Animal Research Center, which is where I met Carmen. Um, she had a pretty cool internship. I would definitely advise you to ask her about it. She did Slice Shear Force. It was pretty, pretty unique and interesting. Um, so that's where I met her. And then I um, kind of turned my internship into um, a project for my master's research. And then I continued working out there as a lab technician for a couple more years and got some, some of the studies published. Um, I am a professional uh, animal scientist, a member of ARPIS, and I've been with Ward Laboratories for four years now. We are uh, members of the NIRS Forage and Feed Testing Consortium, and I'm on that board on the Accuracy and Quality Committee as the chair, and I'm highly involved in the membership and education. So hopefully you'll learn a little bit about NIR in this presentation to do today as well. Okay, so today here's our game plan. First, we're going to talk about why it's important to test forages in general. Um, of course, I'm going to try and tailor this towards pastures. Then we're gonna talk about the proper pr protocols and procedures for taking a pasture sample. Um, and as you'll see by the end of this, that section, hopefully you'll understand that your sampling procedure is really important because the sample that you send to the lab um, is really gonna determine how reliable your lab results actually are. Um, then we're gonna talk about the laboratory analysis just to give you guys a little bit of a background of what we actually do at the lab and what analysis I would recommend you to be running on your pasture samples, what's gonna be the most economical um, for your decision making. And then we're gonna talk about how we apply those numbers from our lab analysis reports to small ruminant nutrition. And that's where the huge impact's really gonna come in. Um, and then last week, Melinda mentioned briefly that you guys maybe had some interest in water analysis. So we're just going to briefly talk about water analysis at the end. So let's get started with the importance of forage analysis. Forages are inherently variable substances. This has been widely accepted across the forage industry. Uh, forage testing has become a really big thing. That's how we buy and sell hay. Um, Silage is very everything, including your pasture um, forages, and probably even more so because there's so many different species out there that you guys need to take into account. Um, so there's species to species differences. Even within the same species, there can be differences um, in forage quality. And then there's a lot of environmental factors that play a role in these differences. So first, this table I am showing you right now um, is really one of my favorites because I think it really illustrates both within species variation and across species variation. Um, but before we move on too much with that, um, there are a few things that I'd like to define. Um, so the first one is CP right here. This stands for crude protein. As all of you, I'm sure, are aware, your animals have a specific requirement for crude protein based on their physiological state and their weight. The next um, constituent from this table, which would be a constituent on your report, is the acid detergent fiber. 
And this is the most indigestible portion of the feed. And so this is really important because your animals don't actually have an acid detergent fiber requirement, but this is used to calculate the total digestible nutrients and your animals do have a requirement for total digestible nutrients and the two have an inverse relationship. So your acid detergent fiber here is the most indigestible portion of the feed. So it follows that the total digestible nutrients or the energy available in that feed is less the more an ADF that you have. So the more fibrous the feed, the less digestible the the less energy that animal can get from that forage. So the next constituent you would see on your report would be NDF or neutral detergent fiber. Um, and usually this is amylase treated when we're talking about NDF, which means that um, the, all of the small sugars have been broken down. And so the difference really between ADF and NDF is the hemicellulose. And the hemicellulose is slowly digestible portion of the feed. And so there is a digestibility factor that it, with NDF, we have to take into account not only the amount that's in the feed, which also impacts the TDN. So it also has an inverse relationship where the more NDF, the less TDN. Um, but we also have to take into effect, account the digestibility of this NDF portion. And we'll get more into that later. Um, but I just want you guys to have a good understanding. And then a lot of you, if you're also um, hay growers, um, you'll know that relative um, feed value, this is a index that we can quickly compare a couple of different forages and see which one is um, higher quality. And that's only based off the ADF and NDF. So that's something to be aware of. So, oops, sorry about that. The point of this, um, table is to show how variable both across species as well as within species. So we're talking about pasture grass. Um, so we might have some sort of clover spe species out there. Uh, and so you can see here the crude protein on these two clover species, it can be very highly variable between 18 and 25% crude protein, which for us, we're like, well, who cares? Um, that's well above a sheep's requirement, right? But that's not the only thing that's going to be out there on our pasture. We're also going to have, you know, some kind of grasses. And so maybe this grass and legume mix is the most um, representative thing on this table to pasture grass. And so um, you can see the crude protein is highly variable, but could be ranging from 9 to 17 percent. Um, ADF also here is highly variable. And along with that, the TDN is highly variable. Um, right there as well as NDF. So you can see as well comparing, let's say, let's just take this grass versus this alfalfa, that not only are they variable within the same species, they're variable between species. So it's very important that we understand that because of this variability, we need to test to know what we're actually feeding. Okay, so what are some of the environmental factors that affect forage quality? So this um, chart shows younger grasses here on the left, grasses and legumes, and more mature grasses and legumes on the right. And so when they're younger, they're more leafy, they're higher in crude protein, there is less stem, and so that means there's less fiber. And as they grow, then we get more fibrous portion and we get less protein. And you can see that there's really a, a, an optimal range here for our yield versus our quality. Okay, but we're grazing pasture, so our yield is just gonna be whatever it is when we put them out there. Um, and so fiber isn't necessarily bad. We need fiber because we don't want those plants laying down in the field. Um, and our fiber also helps with the gut microbes. Um, but it does mean the more fiber, the less energy. And so it's kind of difficult to hit this optimal level of all of the nutrients at once. So that's um, something to think, keep in mind. And then we're going to talk about a couple more. Here's more environmental factors that affect that. Okay, so fertilization. So some of you might fertilize your pastures. Some of you might not. 
Um, it's really important to do soil sampling when you are fertilizing your pastures because fertilizing can improve your protein content and it can help you to decrease ADF and NDF um, values thereby having higher quality forage, more energy available to those animals um, and things like that. However, if you're, if you're having stress on those plants, too much nitrogen could result in high nitrates. So it's important to get it applied at the optimal level, okay? Um, so we kind of covered on the last slide about the leaf to stem ratio. Again, younger plants are gonna have more leafy portions. The leaves is where the protein's at. It's also where all of those soluble sugars that give energy are at. And the stems is where the fiber's at. There's not a lot of protein in them. And so the leafier, the higher um, quality, the more energy, the more protein available for those animals. Okay, now this next one, um, weed content of the forage. So this is probably more um, something to be concerned with when we're talking about hay. However, you guys being sheep and goat um, producers, this is something you need to be aware of because especially you goat um, producers because they will pull the leaves off of those um, weeds. For the most part, the sheep are more of grazers and the goats are browsers. And so the, sh the sheep are mostly going to avoid those weeds because the weeds typically have a higher fiber content. And so they're not gonna be seeking that out. Um, but your goats might pull off some leaves from that. And so it's really important to know what's out in your pastures and know what's, um, gonna potentially be causing harm to those animals if they are eating the leaves or if it's something, um, you know, I don't wanna be very scary here, but it could be like nightshade where they're gonna wanna go for those berries. So it's important to know what's out there. Um, and then of course, something that really affects the quality of the forage is gonna be just the weather. Um, so my example is last year in Nebraska, we had a lot of flooding. And you guys probably didn't experience that. I'm not sure, um, didn't keep up with what was going on in Idaho, but we had a lot of flooding and then we had some drought periods. And so last year I actually had one producer that was in a flood area and then he was, and then he didn't get any moisture for the rest of the growing season. And his alfalfa actually was high in nitrates. And that's very, very, very rare. But we retested it and it was, it was true. It stressed that plant to the point where it actually accumulated nitrates and was not able to convert the nitrogen into protein, okay? And so that goes back again, um, you know, to soil samples when you're doing fertilization and things like that. Um, making sure that ant, that plant has the nutrients it needs and in that particular moment it needed water at different times than when it got water. And of course, being underwater is not helpful either. On the flip side of that, the weather patterns, because we got floods, um, Wyoming and Colorado, those more arid areas actually got more moisture last year. And my producers I work with from those regions were reporting that they had the best pasture forage quality they've seen in years. Um, so it can be, you know, the weather can be your best friend or it can be your worst en enemy, but either way, you need to be aware of the fact that it is going to affect your forage quality. Okay, so why, so we know it's variable, but why, why do we need to, to analyze it? So the reason why we wanna analyze it as livestock producers is we wanna make sure that we are supplementing our animals accordingly. Okay, and so if we know what's in our forages, we can supplement them to meet their requirements. We can reduce under supplementation of livestock. So if we don't know what's in our forages and we assume that we are meeting their needs with their forages because, oh, it looks really green and it looks great out there. Okay, well, if it's not actually meeting their, pro their protein or their mineral requirements, um, you're gonna have reduced reproductive metrics. Um, with, you're gonna have reduced average daily gain. You're gonna have reduced milk production. And so that you that's maybe supporting two lambs out there, she might not be able to do that because she doesn't have the protein, she doesn't have the energy, and she might start losing her own body condition score. Okay, and so then on the flip side of that, okay, well, how about if I just, you know, I don't need to worry about what's out there. I'll just provide them supplement and they'll eat what they need. 
that's not really the case either. If you provide them supplement, a lot of times the supplement is going to be like corn or DDGs, um, soybean meal, things that animals really like to eat, and they're going to overeat, and they are going to be fat. They're going to start getting fat, and you can see some of the same reproductive and production performance issues in fat animals that you'll see in thin animals. So that's why it's really important that we supplement to meet their requirements. Okay, so <clears throat> this table I put in here to show you guys. I know a lot of times, okay, so you're asking me to send, send samples and pay for sample analysis. But right now, you know, COVID-19, times are tough. A lot of times sampling is maybe one of the first things to get cut, okay? But this is a table to show you that it will pay off in the end. Um, I did not reconfigure this table for specific, to be specific to sheep and goats and pasture sampling. Um, this is actually just a, this is actually a real life example of a producer who had two types of hay. He had distiller's grains and he wanted me to help him with his ration. Um, and so then I just took some averages of what the costs are here in Nebraska um, to show how just the crude, just knowing the crude protein could pay off for him. Okay, and so this first row here is the actual crude protein determined by laboratory analysis. Okay, so these are the real numbers here in the first row. Um, and so I set the cost, that's the cost at the requirements. There's no difference there. Um, the second row is the estimated crude protein. At, if you were gonna say, okay, you know what? I don't want to test. I'm going to assume everything's deficient. So I'm going to go with the lowest possible end of the range from the NRC book values. Okay. So you do that. So you can see um, that um, so that this 9% crude protein is what he we were fixing, trying to balance the ration to. So the actual crude protein in that was actually 12.4% in the total ration, okay? And so what ended up happening is that he was losing money because he was overpaying for feed, that extra supplement by $10 a day, okay? And they were also getting more protein than what they actually needed. So he's losing money by assuming he's on the low end range. And so if we just wanted to do just a crude protein analysis, I think it's like $17. Um, you know, that would have paid off over a hundred, cost of 100 cows in just like two days. So then the, the bottom is, okay, the opposite scenario. I'm going to estimate on the high end range here. Okay, and so we're actually shorting animals by crude protein. Um, so here's the, the crude protein that they're getting shorted about 2% per day. And when we're trying to talk about that they need 9%, that's, that's a large proportion of the protein that they're not getting. But hey, you're saving $17. But on the other side of that, $17 per day, how much are you losing on animal performance? Whether it's average daily gain, milk production, breed back rates, weaning weights, all of these things are going to end in economical losses when you're not supplementing. Oh. Okay. So now let's talk about taking a representative sample. So I'm going to talk about three different ways to take a sample. And the reason why I chose these three, the hula hoop method, I had gotten a call from some different nutritionists talking about using this for pasture sampling. However, I think its most applicable use is if you're trying to estimate biomass and cover costs. So I'm going to advise against the hula hoop method, but I'm still going to talk to you about it because it's something you might come across as you're trying to figure out how to sample pasture samples, pasture forages, excuse me. The diagonal hand grab method and the W pattern hand grab method are the two that I would endorse. And it's just going to be up to you of which one you want to choose. And so we're going to back up why I'm telling you these things later. So for now, let's just talk about how to get that representative sample. So the hula hoop method, <clears throat> like I stated before, is 
typically use when you're grazing cover crops and you're trying to figure out how much biomass is out there, I would not recommend for pasture sampling. So what you do, you take a hula hoop, you know the diameter or the radius of that hula hoop, you toss it in the air, you chop all the plant matter within the hula hoop area, and you can use this to estimate the biomass. However, because you're just taking everything, it does not represent the animal's diet well. Even in a cover crop situation, that bottom portion of the plant is gonna get trampled. It's not gonna get consumed. So this is not a good way to estimate our animal diets, okay? So here's Hannah. So she decided to demonstrate the hula hoop method for you. So before we go on, I just wanna briefly mention that when we took our samples, we were just trying to get some uh, numbers that we could show people. Um, we know that the yield and the biomass that's out there is really, really limited. Um, and so she was still supplementing. You'll see um, in a minute some cows and stuff are going to come down, check out what she's doing. They were still getting hay to get that gut fill requirement. And that's another thing that we should keep in mind. Um, when we are doing our pasture samples is just because the numbers on the report say we don't need to supplement, we need to be taking the amount that's available to them into account as well. Okay, so here she threw it. She's collecting all of that, which um, there wasn't a lot. Um, cows get curious, they're coming down. So, and we thank her very much for all of the images that she has provided for this webinar. Okay. So now we're going to talk about the diagonal hand grab method. So the procedure for this is to start in one corner of the field, walk a diagonal line across, taking hand grab samples of the forages. Um, try to take it the way that your animals are grazing. Observe your sheep and your goats. How, do they, how are they grazing the pasture they're currently in? How do you think that's going to apply to the one that you're going to be moving them into? And then take 20 to 50 grabs along the way. Um, the way that I did this was I just took like five steps took a grab, five more steps, took a grab. Um, you can cover a lot of ground that way, especially with the diagonal method. Um, so again, like I said, hand grabs should represent what the animals are actually consuming. This means stay away from the weeds, stay away from the high fiber stuff, um, the stemmy material, and avoid anything that's next to any animal waste because they're not gonna eat that either. So here's how we did it in Hannah's um, pasture. We just walked a diagonal line across it, taking hand grab samples that represented how her cattle were grazing as we went. Okay. <clears throat> uh, w pattern, really the same exact um, principles apply. The only difference is that you're going to cover the pasture you walking the shape of a W. Um, and so in this way, you're going to actually, the thought process is that you would get a more representative sample, but you'll see that um, if you have a pretty representative pasture that's not like you're not trying to cover uplands and lowlands and all in the same, that it's going gonna, it's gonna to do a good job of matching up with that diagonal method. So, so here's how we, we walked our W for Hannah's pasture. Okay, so sample submission. So you might find it odd that I'm showing you the back of the bags first, but there's a couple points that I want to make here. So first of all, this one was the hula hoop method, okay? And you can see in here, this right here, this was those big, tall, weedy, stemmy things that were in there, okay? And you can see that that's not what the animals were grazing, and that's gonna really throw off our fiber and our protein, which we'll see in a few slides, okay? So that's, I um, just wanted you to make note that you can visually tell that that's not right. The other thing about it is look at how fogged up the bags are. We took this on a 70 degree day um, in Nebraska in April and the bags are already fogging up. So the last thing you want to do is take your samples, throw them on the dash with your pickup, drive around for a week and then send them to the lab. First of all, saving them for a week like that, they're not going to represent what's on your um, pasture then later, right? By the time you actually get your results back but they're also gonna be starting to get moldy and yucky and that's gonna impact your results as well. So it's really important to take your samples. If you have to wait a day to send them to the lab, either put them in the fridge. Um, if you're really adamant, you can freeze them and then send them at the soon, as soon as you can after taking them off the field. The best thing would be to 
take your pasture sample, put it in the envelope, put it in the mail. Same day. Okay, so now this is how we marked our samples. We put our account number. It's really important that you include your name, your address, your email, and a phone number. That way, if there are any questions about what's going on with the samples, the lab can contact you. Um, and we can actually talk about an event that would happen um, here in a minute. Make sure that you use the sample ID that it's gonna help you to know what it, what, where this forage came from. So you see we did our sampling methods. So you might want to say home place or um, grandma's field. Name them whatever you call them. Don't call them one, two, and three, and then get your results back and not, not be sure where one, two, and three came from, okay? It's very important because if you don't know where they came from, your results are worthless to you, okay? And then what I always recommend for pasture samples is to mark for an NIR analysis, okay? And also to add minerals. That way you can make sure you're meeting your animal requirements for your macronutrients, which you're gonna get analyzed in the NIR analysis and your micronutrients, which is gonna be your wet chemistry mineral analysis. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about what goes on in the lab. Um, so that you guys can have a good understanding and know when you need to be asking questions and things like that. So like I stated on the previous slide, for NIR analysis, um, your macronutrients NIR is going to be the most economical and you're going to get the most constituents on your report. So you're going to learn the most about your feeds by requesting this analysis. Um, Ward Laboratories is a member of the NIRS Forage and Feed Testing Consortium. So that means that our equations are very robust. We have thousands of samples in them and they come from all over across the country. So they will do just as well for our Nebraska forages as they will for your Idaho forages as they do for, we get forages from New Mexico, um, you know, all over, Kentucky even. So we really, we really do a good job of having robust equations that are going to give you good numbers for your macronutrients, which is going to be your protein, your acid detergent fiber, neutral detergent fiber, your fat, all of those kinds of things. Okay. And then wet chemistry analysis needs to be done for micronutrients or your minerals. And this, I will explain why we need to use wet chemistry in a minute. Okay. So first to give you an idea of what NIR analysis is about. Okay. So you, so it takes the same principles of, of other wet chemistry analysis, okay? You're testing an unknown sample and you're comparing it to a library of known samples. In wet chemistry analysis, we compare an unknown sample to a standard curve. So this, this is a starch, but the thing is, this, this isn't how the sample came into the lab. Um, here's our standard curve over here, and this over here is our unknown sample, but that's not how it comes into the lab. We have done extractions and there's many technician steps to get it to that point, okay? But, be, but by doing this, we can say, oh, this one's about 150 micrograms per milliliter of starch. Um, and then of course we convert that on your reports so that you make sense to you. So for NIR, we're comparing spectra of an unknown sample to spectra of a library of known samples, okay? So like I said, so comparing an unknown sample to a database of known samples, we're using the near infrared region of the electromagnetic spectrum. Okay, so that's this part right here is what we're using. Um, so the way that this works is that your sample interacts with the light and it, some of the light is either absorbed and some of it is reflected. And that's what the detector uses to create what's called a spectra. These bonds, carbon, hydrogen, carbon, carbon, nitrogen bonds, um, oxygen, hydrogen bonds, all of these bonds have a little bit of motion to them. And that's what's causing the reflectance or the absorbance. Our small molecules like calcium, magnesium, uh, especially our, our really one, our ones that are in parts per million, our zinc, our copper, 
they don't have bonds that are going to be able to reflect and absorb the light. Those small molecules cannot be seen by the NIR. However, they are correlated with those larger molecules. So you will see that some reports, some people may measure NIR, um, excuse me, your micronutrients or your minerals by NIR, <clears throat> but those are just correlations. So they're not as accurate as the wet chemistry. So we need to make sure that we're using NIR for our crude protein, energy, all of those big things. And for our little minerals, those need to be measured by wet chemistry to ensure that they're good and accurate. Okay, so again, it, NIR is a secondary method of analysis. So this here, this is what your spectra looks like. So that's what's generated by that detector. Um, so this can be just as accurate as wet chemistry. It can only be as accurate as the wet chemistry that it's based on. However, it can actually be more repeatable because there are less sample handling steps. And so with the consortium, we put together a table where we found to get an equivalent um, report to the NIR analysis that is produced from their equations, it would be 179 sample handling steps by the technicians as opposed to just one. So that really reduces a lot of places where technicians can make errors. That's why it's more repeatable. Okay, so now that you understand how to take a sample, what happens to the sample in the lab, and then so it's time for us to look at the actual results of our three different methods. Okay, so let's just review. So we've got crude protein here. We've got ADF, which is our acid detergent fiber, um, which is the in most indigestible portion of the feed. We have amylase treated NDF, which is our most indigestible and slowly digestible portion of the feed. Our total digestible nutrients, which our animals have a requirement for. And then I just threw RFV and RFQ up here um, because I know a lot of you are probably familiar with it, but I'm not really gonna talk about it much because in terms of animal requirements, that's not necessary. Okay, so let's just compare these methods. So the hula hoop method, the first thing I need to tell you is that because it did have that STEMI stuff and that doesn't really represent what we're feeding animals, so that doesn't represent samples that are in the consortium library, we chose to actually report the wet chemistry data, which actually wasn't too far off from what NIR predicted. So make sure that you take a good sample making sure we're applying the right equations. It's all part of making sure that we have good, accurate data to make our supplementations off of, okay? So you can see the dry matter is completely skewed by that weed in there. Same with the crude protein, but you can see that it's matching up very well between the diagonal and the W pattern. Now looking at ADF, again, that's skewed, but the diagonal and W pattern, it matches up very well. A, the amylase treated NDF, again, skewed by that huge weed that was in there, but the diagonal and the W pattern, it matches very well. And so then these are just calculated um, values. We're not gonna worry about those, but moving forward, we're not gonna worry about the hula hoop analysis. We're gonna base all of our supplementation strategy and what we're gonna learn from the report based only on the diagonal and the W pattern. Um, so the same thing goes here for our minerals. Um, the hoo hoop method that weed in there just threw everything off. So we're not going to worry about that. Okay, so those are the numbers that we got back from the lab. So now what are we going to do with them? <clears throat> the first thing to do is to know what your animal's nutrient requirements are. So you can find this in the nutrient requirements of small ruminants, the NRC book, which would probably be the best um, resource for you. I did find this in an extension publication. You can find a lot of NRC, you know, right here. The NRC stuff has been summarized in a lot of extension publications. So, we are going to use this table and we're going to look at both nursing a single, oops, single. So we can see that she's got some different requirements there. So I'm going to carry over to the next page. And we're going to also look at when she's nursing twins. So you can see that her requirements are different. 
So she has a different energy requirement, a little bit different protein requirement. And so interpreting our reports are going to change based on if we're talking about a 175 pound body weight you with a single versus twins. And of course, then if you're a goat producer or your ewes are smaller body weight or heavier body weight, all of this is variable. So you're going to have to look up your individual situation. You can't just apply everything across the board. Okay, so let's take a look. So first looking at this lactating a single lamb, protein requirement is at 13.3%. On our report, protein is exceeding that. So that's good. We don't have to supplement protein. Uh, for TDN, same thing. Uh, we're basically right at those TDN requirements, so we don't need to worry. Now let's take a look if she's having twins, if she's trying to support twins. Her protein requirement is more because she's obviously trying to produce more milk, but again, her protein is high there. But her TDN is higher as well, and it's below what it's higher than what's on our report. So it looks like we're going to need to supplement her just a tiny little bit. So that's the most concerning thing. Um, the other thing I want to mention is that we do need to pay attention to NDS. Okay. And the reason for this is because we can't just look only at our nutrients that we know we have requirements for. We also need to examine other characteristics of the forage that might impact um, her ability to actually get those nutrients out of the forage, okay? And so I'm just gonna, I said we were gonna ignore the hula hoop method, but let's say this 64.3 was actually what was here for these patterns, okay? So that would be very high NDF. So when you see a high NDF value, I, I think around 60 is when it starts to actually impact animal performance. Um, you need to be con concerned a little bit, okay? And so, when you have a high NDF, it slows the passage rate and increases time ruminating. The reason why is because that feed or forage needs to be at a one millimeter diameter to pass from the rumen to the omasum. And so the more fibrous the feed, the more time it's gonna take her to chew that up to make sure that it gets um, to the size it needs to be. So more time ruminating leads to less time out there actually grazing and consuming forage. When there's less time to consume forage, it means there's less um, feed that she's actually able to consume. And so she might not actually meet these intake requirements, okay? So it's really important that we look at the characteristics of the forage and make sure she's able to, to get there. Um, and on the flip side of that, where this is actually really high protein, high energy stuff, um, if we are feeding like Hannah's beef cows, they still needed hay in order to get their gut fill, which is really what that intake requirement is. So we need to make sure that we're meeting all of that. Okay, so now let's take a look at the micronutrients or our minerals. So we are going to look at the requirements of the, the sheep, the ewe nursing twins um, versus what our report said, okay? So we're gonna go through this mineral by mineral. So we wanna make sure that our report is in between her requirements and her maximum tolerable levels, okay? Because if we're at the maximum tolerable levels, we're going to have issues. And if we're below requirements, then we're going to have deficiency issues. So calcium looks good. Let's see. Phosphorus also looks good. When one thing to keep in mind is that even though your lab report is only going to report minerals, no mineral acts alone. So you also need to be aware of what your calcium to phosphorus ratio is. So it should be between two and one. And these are, so that's really good. So we don't have to supplement um, phosphorus, which is one of the most expensive minerals to supplement. So our report and just knowing that might've just paid for itself just by not having to supplement phosphorus, right? Um, but again, no mineral acts alone. So we've also got potassium here, 
and potassium is a tricky one because it's usually very high in forages, um, but it can also tie up some of our magnesium and our calcium. So here's our magnesium here. It's basically right at the requirement. So I might suggest that we want to supplement a tiny little bit, but not a lot, um, because you can see the maximum tolerable level is pretty low. Um, but we also need to take into account the tetany risk ratio, which is the potassium divided by the calcium plus the magnesium. Again, no mineral works by itself. Um, and so that's, that's good. Um, Zinc is also good between the requirement and the to maximum tolerable levels. Iron in this, these samples is just so crazy high. Um, this is a point where I might ask the lab to rerun it because that is very, very high. Um, but it, if it comes back and it repeats, which where we were actually doing two samples, I'd say that's repeated. That's where the iron's at, unfortunately, for these. Um, where the maximum tolerable level is 500, we might be seeing some issues here. But again, it also depends on bioavailability. So if most of this isn't just going to pass right through and it's not going to be absorbed, we might not actually have an issue. So that's um, an unfortunate thing about minerals is that it all, you need to follow the guidelines. It also depends on bioavailability and the lab can't tell you that. There's no lab that can, to my knowledge. Okay, so our manganese is good here. It's also between the requirement and the maximum tolerable levels. Copper is one that we're gonna wanna look out for here. So we're right at 15, which is the max tolerable level. However, iron does tie up copper, so we probably aren't seeing copper issues here. I'm sure all of you being sheep and goat producers know how important, how thin of a line you guys have to walk there with copper. Um, so that's always something to be aware of. Oops, excuse me, I didn't mean to fast forward. <clears throat> Sulfur, again, it's actually a little bit below her requirements, um, but it's another one that does tie up copper, so I would be very cautiously supplementing that. Sodium, we don't expect them to get their sodium from their forages, so you always need to, you know, supplement some sort of salt in there. And then um, sheep are really unique in the fact that they do have a molybdenum requirement right here. Um, and again, we're between the requirement and the maximum tolerable level, so that one should be good. Okay, so that's a lot of information and a lot of numbers that I've just thrown at you, so let's summarize. Okay, so interpreting this forage report, here's our takeaways. If she's nursing twins, she's gonna need a little energy. I understand you guys aren't gonna have separate pastures for twins versus singles. Um, so I'd say just supplement a little bit of energy. Um, it's not gonna hurt the other ones. You, you're gonna need to consult with a veterinarian or a small ruminant nutritionist about the iron bioavailability and the toxic risks associated with it being that high. Um, there may be some copper toxicity concerns if that iron isn't tying up that copper, you may be needing to supplement a little bit more molybdenum um, to tie up that copper. And then, of course, provide salt to ensure normal physiological functions. Okay, so I'm briefly going to go over interpreting a livestock suitability report. If you want more in-depth information about um, Livestock water quality analysis. I will be giving another webinar in June about this topic. So you can contact me um, or Melinda, or you can follow Ward Laboratory's social media, um, and that the link will be posted soon. So let's get into this. Okay, so we're just going to go over a report today. Um, something I did want to point out I didn't show you guys an actual report from the NIR and the wet chemistry analysis, but we do participate in proficiency programs, which is what this signifies right here. Um, so good labs will always participate in those and just, it's just a third party that checks, sends samples and checks that the results are what they should be. Um, so, so this is our livestock suitability report. We're gonna go a little bit, hopefully make that so you guys can see. 
So the first thing we're going to look at is the pH. Okay, and so this is really important for normal physiological function. Um, for small ruminants, it needs to be between 6.5 and 8.5. So this report is saying it's good. We also need to look at the total dissolved solids and the electrical conductivity, um, which are actually the same thing, just reported in two different ways. Um, and so this is between uh, what's considered safe, a, a range that's considered safe for small ruminants and beef cattle as well. Um, so the animals that are more susceptible to this kind of stuff is gonna be like your chickens and your swine. Um, sodium is less than 100, 800. Um, so sodium is something to be really um, aware of in your water if you do get above that 800 parts per million range. Uh, they might stop drinking as much water. And as we know, they really need a lot of water to have normal physiological function, to have good production performance, to digest their feed. All of those things are so important. Um, so this is where a flag comes up. So the hardness here at 379, when very hard is considered greater than 180, well, the NRC doesn't actually have any recommendations or anything like that about hardness. They just say if it's very hard, this means you might have some mineral issues. So if you're having mineral issues, it's always a good thing to test your water because hardness is this calcium carbonate. So there could be an excess of calcium here, which is gonna you know, mess with your potassium, your magnesium, your phosphorus. So you might be seeing all kinds of different types of issues. Um, and then you might need to actually get a water report that delves deeper into your minerals. Um, and so this kind of, the, T, the TDS, um, this is something I should have brought up um, where I'm trying to do this briefly, but the total dissolved solids is really important and it's going to play a role in the hardness, especially if you guys are letting animals drink from ponds or lakes. And if you have like drought conditions, when you see those water lines receding, those solids are getting more and more concentrated, okay? So you might be getting above this, you know, 3,000 parts per million range that's considered safe. And so it's, as the season goes on, as the summer goes on and those lakes and things get concentrated, it's important that you test as you go. And so if you test once and you don't see a difference between test one and test two, you might be okay. It might not be receding. You might be fine. If you do start seeing more concentrated values, it might indicate you need to be testing more often and eventually might be leading to the point where you need to provide a different clean water source for them. Okay, so nitrates, of course, we all are aware nitrates can result in abortions, um, death losses, decreased production. So this report, it was fine, but um, it's important to check. Sulfates, uh, polio and cephalomalacia, most of the producers that I've spoke with that have that issue, they have high sulfate water. So that's important. Um, and then I don't, the NRC doesn't really have guidelines for the rest of what's on this report. So I don't have anything to say about it. Um, but there are other contaminants that could be potentially in your water. Um, we are now offering heavy metal testing and I know, I don't know enough about your guys' location in Idaho to know if you guys have any specific issues, but I know Western Nebraska, Western South Dakota, parts of Wyoming, parts of Colorado, they have selenium issues. So this might be something that you need to consider testing. So I went through the water report really fast. So if you're confused, um, of course, you can ask me questions, um, but we do have, we put out the ward guide, and so this is a really great resource both for your water analysis. When you get that back, compare your results to what the ward guide says, where we've condensed what the NRC recommendations are. Um, we also have a section that's all about feed testing, so it's a really good resource for you guys. So today we went over the importance of forage analysis, and this is because forages are so variable, both within species, across species, and based on environmental factors. So unless you test, it's just a guess. That's the industry cliche, but it couldn't be more true. Um, we talked about how to take a pasture sample. I recommend using hand grabs and walking a diagonal or a W through your pasture to make sure it's representative of what your animals are consuming. 
We talked about laboratory analysis, how we need to use NIR for our macronutrients, our protein, our fibers, our things like that. And then we need to use a wet chemistry analysis to get accurate readings on our minerals for good protein, energy, and mineral supplementation plans on pasture. Uh, we talked about how to interpret this specific to your animal. And then we briefly went over a livestock suitability analysis. So with that, if you guys have any questions, um, that was the end of my presentation. Awesome. Um, we do have one question, but if you guys have any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat or the Q&A box as we wrap up here. Um, and for those of you that are jumping off, please make sure you fill out the survey that will pop up. It just helps us get better every time we do these webinars. Um, the one question that we have right now is, is there a minimum amount of forage that you need to send when you submit a sample? Yes. So if you go out and you take your 20 to 50 grabs, you should be filling up a quart-sized Ziploc bag with no problem. Um, and most labs prefer to have a quart-sized Ziploc bag. That way we can take a split for to be the lab sample that we actually do the analysis on and then we can retain part of that sample for a little for a short short period of time so it's important to go over your results as soon as you get them um, because then i review them at the end of the day but i don't catch everything if you catch something that doesn't seem right we can always also go back into that original sample and retest it again so that's why we like to have that much but also in order to get a good representative sample you should be collecting a lot of forage um so a ziploc or a sandwich size or a snack size is just not going to cut it okay how often do you recommend sampling throughout the grazing season okay so that's really going to depend on what your goals are with sampling. If you're going to be reformulating your supplements every time you move them, then I would say every time you move them. If you're going to do like a spring supplement, a summer supplement, and a fall, um, then those would be the times when I would, I would sample. So you want to sample as close to when you're going to be making those decisions as possible um, so that it really represents what's out there on the pasture. Okay. Um. This question is, says your water analysis didn't include iron. We have a lot of iron in our water here. Do you okay. guys check for that? Um, yeah, I believe we do. Let me, let me just double check. I believe we do chest for iron um, in waters. Typically every mineral that we do in feeds, we also do waters, but let me, let me just make sure. Yep, um, it's $6.50 for an iron, just for the iron and water, if that's all you wanted to test. Or you can add that to the livestock suitability test. Okay. And I guess the only other question at this point is, did do you have um, somewhere that you could direct people on how to take a water sample? Oh, okay, so we, haven't made any resources for that yet. We have how to take a bacteria sample, but not for just um, regular. But what I would say on that, yeah, I don't have any resources. That's a good point of something we should make. Um, but if it's something, if you're sampling from like a well, whatever the faucet is that it comes out of, that's going to be fine. Um, just use a water bottle. You can use, you know, just one that you drink out of. Um, you know, 12 ounce water bottle, 16 ounce, whatever you, whatever it is. And just make sure you rinse it with the source that you're collecting from three times and then collect your sample. Um, and then I would say for the pond, you do need to make a kind of a contraption of, you know, taping something to a stick so that you can pull from the middle um, so that it actually is a good representation of what's, what's in that pond because it can be overly exaggerated how poor quality of water is the, the nearer it is to the edge so awesome um i think that's all the questions that we have so thank you so much for joining us this has been really informative um and the, uh, the awesome thing about what you just shared is that we can work together for all of you guys listening to this webinar um you know send your samples in get some things tested and if you ever need some help 
um, with interpretation or comparing back to your specific animal needs, work with Rebecca or I or Carmen um, to make sure that you're getting what you need and we can also help you understand how to supplement properly if you need it. So 